So without further ado, let's get started with our first talk on diversity, intersectionality, and psychotherapy from Dr. Dwight Turner. So Dr. Turner is a psychotherapist, senior lecturer, and researcher at the School of Applied Social Science at Brighton University, who casts an intersectional lens on privilege, supremacy, otherness, and social justice. He was invited to deliver the keynote presentation at the BACP's Working with Diversity Conference in 2019. Dr. Turner's blog post, Black Steel in the Hour of Chaos, addressed the anguish and the action that has risen from the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis and has been widely, widely read by UK and US therapists. His new book, Intersections of Privilege and Otherness to Counseling and Psychotherapy, will be published by Routledge in February 2021. You can keep up to date with his work and his latest blog posts at www.dwightturnercounseling.co.uk and follow him on Twitter at dturner300. So let's give Dr. Turner a warm welcome. It's great to have him here with us and we'll just get started whenever you're ready, Dr. Turner. All right, Thank thanks. Thank you very much, Niles. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, good morning to you all. It's my pleasure to be the first speaker on this day on diversity. I can see in the chat there are lots of people who are just putting in their good mornings. It's nice to see you all, even virtually. Okay, like as Niall has already said, I am Dr. Dwight Turner, or just Dwight for those of you on the call today. And I'm going to be here talking to you about the link between uh, an inter inter intersectional theory uh, and privilege and otherness and how this type plays out in the world of psychotherapy. So I'm going to split this talk into uh, several stages, basically. I'm going to talk with I'm actually going to, we've got some bits of film to show you as well on the web, which I'll, I'll talk about as, as we go along. But first of all, we're going to talk about what is intersectionality, if I can speak this morning. We're going to look at how early life and early life attachments create and manifest difference and what that might be like. We're going to explore privilege and the creation of the other. Then we're going to look at how the other, we're going to look at the other and a, as a relational perspective. And, and how that creates the isms, racism, sexism, and then the, the obvious, homophobia, and so on. And then I've got some visual examples of othering, racism, sexism, and in, in the internalized impact of what it is to be the other, okay? So the first thing I thought I would do this morning to start things off is basically just to get you to relax. Now, I don't know where you are. Hopefully, you're all just sat there with your cup of tea or coffee or hot chocolate on a Sunday morning, just resting up. The first thing though, is just to get you in touch with what it's like to actually um, be a part of this, this conference this morning, and just to start to connect with your own sense of being an outsider, of being the other. One of the reasons I say that is this, we all have an experience of being another. The thing where we all have an experience of privilege, and I will say a bit more about that as we go along. There was a person on this call this morning, who hasn't had an experience of being marginalized in some way. Sometimes, though, we forget that, or we just make out it's somebody else's problem, but it's not. So what I'm going to do is play you a piece of music. I'm going to ask you just to sit and ponder what it's like for you to be an outsider. Let's play a bit of music to start off with. Hopefully... You've had a chance just to relax and just to tune in to that piece of music, okay? Um, one of the reasons why I play a piece of music at, a, at a, the beginning of a talk like this is just to help you uh, just connect with where you're at, with what it is to be an outsider. Maybe you're a woman of color, maybe you're a, a woman in a patriarchal environment, disabled, LGBTQ. We've, we live in an age, therefore, whereby difference and otherness and diversity is very much around us. You know, we've just come out of a, we've just watched in the States, for example, um, numerous marches and so on around difference, especially around the election in the States. Uh, the Me Too movement is still very much alive and well um, around the world, as it should be. Uh, there are often protests about trans rights. George Floyd, George Floyd sadly was murdered um, back in, was it May time this year? Difference and diversity is one of these areas that actually we don't really understand, and yet it's something that we need to really get a grip on in the world, the world that we live in. Now, for my work as a, psychotherapy, as a psychotherapist and also as a lecturer, I take a more intersectional approach to trying to understand issues of difference and diversity. I think 
what often happens is we're very much limited, especially in this country, in the UK, to seeing things through the lens of the nine protected characteristics of the 2010 Equalities Act. And for myself, that's a very limited way of approaching issues of difference. That's why I actually take on ideas or try and, or try and work with intersectional approaches. Now, I could sit here and actually just talk to you about what it actually means. But I think what's better for me, instead of mansplaining it or Dwight explaining it perhaps on a Sunday morning, one of the best things that I can do is actually get one of the founding members of intersectional approaches to actually talk about it herself. So for the second video from this morning, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, a professor of law at, at UCLA and Columbia Law School, uh, I think I'm going to get her to actually talk to you all about just what intersectionality is all about. I'm going to play this piece of video now. Okay, so hopefully you've just heard uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. Uh, I know there were some issues with the sound. My apologies for that. I will mute my microphone uh, when I play the next piece of video so it doesn't interrupt too much. Um, as she states there, Kimberly Crenshaw, there are different. We all walk with different layers of privilege and otherness. We all work with different, different layers of. of of, uh, of outsiderness. And these are things that we need to be aware of as and well we, we walk through life. Um, we don't just, uh, you know, I'm sitting here, for example, as a black man. Um, and, you know, these are layers, these are parts of my identity which have actually marked me out to be an outsider. You know, I can't sit here and say that I haven't been ostracized out of some sort of group or I haven't had people sit in every other part of a train carriage as opposed to sitting with myself. Um, these are things that we all experience. And, and part of the reason why I'm doing this talk this morning is to bring you into connection with your own understanding and experience of this. Now, one of the things I want to just add here is that an intersectional approach, it's although Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Hills Collins talk widely about intersectionality, uh, this is not just something which has come about now. There is a moral aspect to intersectionality, which I think I need to just highlight and to remind you all of in a way. And I've done this through the lens of Sylvia Pankhurst's story. Uh, now, for those of you who know Sylvia Pankhurst, you had a couple of seconds just to tune out. But Sylvia Pankhurst is the daughter of Emmeline Pankhurst, uh, one of the major figures in the, the feminist movement here in the UK. Um, and Sylvia and her other sister, whose name I forget, actually, were actually there on the front lines. Um, You'd often see them in some of the pictures where they were they were taken away by the police for chaining themselves to railings and so on. Sylvia Pankhurst though had a bit of a fallout or a bit of a different took a different direction to her mother and her sister in that she wasn't just going to focus in on issues for white British women. Sylvia Pankhurst actually one of the things, things I love about her story is that she actually took on the fight for workers' rights as well. So, for example, workers at the time uh, were. Even though they had unions, the unions had very little power, and Sylvia Pankhurst fought for workers' rights of better working conditions, breaks, those sorts of things, during the, the, the industrial age of the, of the last early part of the last century. So much so, she did so much work that when she was arrested, often for protesting, that actually the unions would club together, raise the funds necessary to then have her released from prison, to pay her bail. Another story out of Sylvia Pankhurst's life, if you like, was that actually she was one of the few... Uh, activists, if you like, to travel to the former Soviet Union in the time just be before Stalin's purges. And she met a number of p politicians, artists, and so on, looking for ways to actually help them come to the, come to, come to the West or to find ways to support themselves whilst, before the, the purges actually took place. Many of the people that she worked with, sadly, were actually killed by Stalin in the years post that. But this picture here is one of my favorite pictures of Sylvia Pankhurst. And this is a picture of her with His Royal Hand Highness, Heidi Selassie, taken in Wimbledon, I think it would have been, when he was, when Heidi Selassie was actually in the UK in exile because Mussolini's uh, fascists were attempting to invade Ethiopia. And she stood, she protested on his behalf, petitioned the government and so on. The government weren't so interested, but she took, she used her power, her sense of privilege to actually stand up and fight for the rights of other people. That for me, this sort of person, for me, is an example of an intersectionalist, somebody who recognizes as a moral aspect to fighting for the other. And this is something that we often forget in this uh, discussion around difference and diversity. We're, just, we're, we're so often, so often let, look at it in our own sense of otherness that we forget that we also have privilege and we can use that privilege to help and assist others around us. 
Right. I want to take us now on to understanding early life difference. What is that all about? And this is a, a clip here or a picture of uh, Barack Obama's tweet. Was it, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion? It's, a, it's not his quote, but he borrowed it at around the time of the Charlottesville uh, riots. I think we were in 2017 or something like that, if I remember rightly. Um, and it's, you know, it, it was a record tweet with 2.8 million likes. And it's, it's, you know, it raises the issue of, is a fear of difference natural or learned? Now, often on psychotherapy courses, on psychology courses and so on, what we often fail, fail to do is to recognize that actually understanding early life difference is hugely important to recognizing where it comes in as an adult. We have the tools, we have the knowledge, and parts of these slides I'm going to show you right here is actually where this knowledge comes from. For example, what I've done here is broken this down to three sections, three different slides. Uh, in the middle part there, you've got the work of Jean Piaget, who wrote a number of books. He was a contemporary of Sigmund Freud, wrote a number of books around issues of difference. How does a child, how does a baby interact with difference, with the other? Being the, and the other in this case is often um, mother or father or a primary caregiver of some type. To the left there, you've got a, a, some work by Francis Aboud, who wrote a brilliant book called Children and Prejudice which was out in 1988. It's still available, secondhand more often than not. But in her book, she talked a lot about, she went to a lot more detail, a lot more depth around how children experience the other and how they interact with difference. So these are people who've actually written about this material that we often don't see in our training courses and in our work wider life. So for example, in the years of zero to two, Piaget talks about um, the child is quite narcissistic. There is an inability to assume the role of the other. So when a child calls and the baby and, and the mother or the, or the caregiver meets that need, the child believes that it's the center of the universe and it has ultimate control over those who are around it. For Abood, she looked at the child starting to learn about what is me and what is not me, and they start to mimic the behaviors of others. So for example, for those of you who've been around children, often they'll stick out their tongue when an adult does the same sort of thing, or they'll make the same sort of sound. They start to mimic things. But often the child believes that it has control over that which is it, which is it is mimicking. Between the ages of three and six, for Piaget, his idea was that the child starts to move from an egocentric stage of development into recognizing that there is another out there. But even though there is an other, a mother, a father, they struggle to assume the role of the, of the other. Um, maybe they can play things out but they're still in a performative stage. For Abu, though, between the ages of three and four, children are better at noticing differences. Their thinking is limited, for example, and they often start to form pre-prejudices. Now, this stage is very important. It's often around this sort of stage that um, children are influenced by their parents. So if often if parents or caregivers have prejudicial views, then what happens is those views influence the children and reinforce those sort of negative, limited ideas um, that children have. I'm just looking, looking at, at some of the comments coming in here. Children and Prejudice was the name of the book by Francis Aboud. Children, I will write this down later on for yourselves in the chat when I get a moment. Between the ages of five and six, children will start to ask questions about difference. And they can start to understand the, the explanations given to them. As long as those explanations are actually rooted in some sort of non-prejudicial way of being of the parent or the caregiver. Um, but they can also start to understand and make distinctions between members of the same groups that they reside within. Uh, this moves on to the next stage, the final stage from the age of seven and eight, where Piaget talks about a child moving from an ego uh, uh way of understanding the world to a more sociocentric stage of interacting with the world. And I'm using that word for a reason, where children start to perform interact with the other and they're able to hold two positions. They can see that somebody else is impacted by their, their experiences. For Abu, she goes a bit further and she looks at how children around the ages of seven and eight start to recognize that actually they can feel a sense of pride or shame about their own cultural, gendered experience, whatever it might be. So for example, I remember when I was around the age of eight years old, um, for myself, that was the first time I started. I saw the, the, the program Roots on TV and started to real, really have to sit with 
the sense of shame uh, around being an outsider. Now, one of the reasons I'm, I've just whistled through that very quickly is just to let you know that actually children don't experience difference and otherness via the, um, the nine protected characteristics of the Equalities Act. They form groups and groupings based upon whatever they see as, a, as difference. It could be that you know, a child has red hair, so another group of children will exclude them in some way. Or somebody's too tall, and therefore the other group of children actually marginalize them because they seem, you know, they, 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 they seem scary to them. The pictures here are of a personal story of my own. Like I said, I would share one or two as we go along here. These, these two pictures to the left there are of my daughter. And the one to the very far left here in the green jacket is my daughter when she was around the age of three years old. Um, this was taken at a time where she was actually at uh, nursery. And during one summer, she was at nursery and a group of older kids, came, I think they were about the age of, age of six or, or, or so. And one of the children there starts to marginalize my daughter because they said she had horrible hair and dirty skin. Now, understandably, my daughter comes home that night in tears, believing that she's ugly and horrible because of what these children have said about her. Um, and I took it upon myself to think, okay, you know how, for those of you who are parents who have been around children, going to a school or to a nursery to actually challenge some of these things is actually really difficult because often they don't, they don't want to recognize it as a problem at play. But what I did do was do a bit of research around hair and so on. And, and, uh, and as a means of trying to help my daughter to recognize that actually she is a pretty young girl. And there's a wonderful book uh, out there called Hair Love. Um, which I recommend for those of you who've been around black kids at, at all. Um, it was also turned into, a, into a, an animated film, which you can see on YouTube. It's called Hair Love, and it won an Oscar, I think it was last year, 2019. And I showed this book to my, my daughter. She loved it. She loved the film as well. And we decided to make Sunday mornings our time where I do her hair. It's meant I've had to go away and look at all sorts of YouTube videos about hair, how to do hair, which is a bit difficult when you don't have any of your own. But it does actually help to actually bond myself to my daughter so that she recognizes that she's beautiful as she is. And it helps to repair something in that experience. I've used that just as an example of just what it's like for a child to experience difference and otherness and to be impacted by the words, deeds of other kids around their same age. Let's move on before I make too many people giggle. Right. A few minutes, let's talk about privilege and otherness. Because one of the things about difference, and one of the things that Kimberly, Kimberly, Kimberly Crenshaw talks about is, actually, although we all work with layers of, of difference, we all, we all work, work with layers of privilege as well. It's never, never one side or the other. And often what happens in an understanding of inter, inter, intersectional approaches is there's an assumption that it's a race to the bottom, that we all have increasing layers of difference that um, we all have to hold. And it's a race to the bottom. And I think it's one of the flaws of, it's not really a flaw of intersectionality. It's a flaw in the reading of it. Because that's not what she's saying. If you go to the video, if you see it later on, it's on YouTube again. What she actually says is we all have layers of privilege too. Now, this diagram, which I got off the, off the internet there, talks about this brilliantly. So, for example, below the middle line there, you've got where we all work with uh, ways of, of experience of, of difference, of being another. For example, if I use my own example here, um, I'm, you know, I'm non-European by origin. I'm a person of color. Um, I'm from working class stock, and I'm old. Yes, I'm 51 years of age. Uh, to borrow a line from the now legendary uh, anthropologist and, uh, and lecturer, uh, Indiana Jones, it is not the years, it is the mileage. Because uh, I often feel it in the morning, to be honest. But also, I also work with layers of privilege. I'm male. I'm heterosexual. I'm able-bodied. Uh, and I guess I'm highly literate as an academic. These are layers of privilege that I have. And they all make up aspects of my identity. This is important. Identity is not one fixed point. Often we say, well, I'm a man. Or I'm a man and I'm black. And that's it. But actually, identity is multifaceted. 
This is just one example. Those of you who are watching this right now will come up with your own ideas of what identity actually is, what your identity is. The other part to it is to recognize that identity does not stay static or fixed. For example, although I'm 51 now, at some point, <laughs> an obvious statement, I would have been in my 20s, which would have given me a certain amount of privilege of youth. We live in a culture whereby we value youth over that of age. For those who are women on this call, you'll probably understand this way better than I do. I was talking to a colleague of mine the other day about the idea that actually women of a certain age, as you get older, you're not seen by society in anywhere near the same way as you would have done by when you were younger. Because we live in a culture whereby we privilege a certain age, a certain group. Difference can also be unprivileged, can also be dependent on where you are situated. Although I'm, a, I'm an academic, on this call this morning, that gives me a certain amount of privilege because I'm Dr. Dwight Turner. But put me in a room full of builders, for example, and I'm the outsider. I have to adapt to their way of being, to their language. I can either do that and engage with their world because I'm the other, or I can try and make myself seem supreme in some way by saying, by lording it over them in some way, like I'm more literal than, literal than they are, and totally exclude myself and put them down. I have a choice in that matter. This diagram here to show you how fluid identity actually is. And when we go into identity, key parts, we do ourselves and ideas of identity a huge, huge disservice. I'm going to play a piece of music again. This one is uh, about a, a technique that I use when working with students around privilege and otherness. Um, and it's something called the privilege walk. And it's a, an idea designed by BuzzFeed. I'll show you the, the, the diagram um, so you can actually have an idea as, as to what how this actually works. Now, one of the reasons I share uh, that video is, like I said, it's a technique that I've used with students. I think somebody in the chat there put in the, in the days of, yeah, in the days pre-social distancing. It's a very good comment. Um, and doing it in a group setting with a group of students who maybe trust it, hopefully trust each other by that point, can be really powerful in showing a group just where difference or, or privilege and otherness sits in their space, in a cohort of, like, let's say, 20 students. Um, and when I've used that sort of technique, it's, it, we don't, it often brings up a lot of, inf a lot of information, but also a lot of pain, uh, senses of shame, for example, which can be held in a group space. I think that's hugely important. Um, and it doesn't have to be the shame of being an other, of being an outsider. It can also be the shame of actually holding privilege which one doesn't realize that they have. I've known lots of students, for example, be at the very front and say, actually, you know what? I don't like being here. And remember one, one year, a student literally crab crawling as fast as she could back towards the back because she didn't want to recognize that actually she held privilege. The problem with that is we often, for whatever reason, and we've had power taken away from us in the past through our interactions with other people, Often to recognize that we do have power is hugely reparative. Privilege is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. Um, where it becomes a negative is when we forget that we actually have a responsibility to other people around us. So coming back to Sylvia Pankhurst's example, she actually, even though she recognized she had privilege, she used that privilege appropriately. She had the money to go and travel off to the Soviet Union to go and help uh, the minorities over there. She had the, the wherewithal and, and, and the skill to actually go and help uh, the working class in this country. It's how you use that. Privilege only becomes supremacy when we reject that we have a responsibility towards the other. And that's hugely important. Now, for those of you who in the chat are asking about, is there an online version of that to use? If you go to the BuzzFeed website, yes, there is. Uh, the reason I mention that is, Actually, I've done it myself. Go to BuzzFeed.com and, and put in the privilege exercise, the privilege walk. There will be a series of questions that you can ask yourself uh, around privilege. It's not, don't, don't get me wrong, it's not particularly scientific. It's just to give you an understanding of where you are, where your identity actually is. So I've done it myself uh, probably a couple of years ago now. I chanced it too often because I, I kind of like not being in therapy sometimes. Um, and it's, as it states there, you know, I got 50 out of 127. So I grew up with an intersectional identity and life never lets me, lets me forget it. It says that I've had my fair share of struggles, but I've worked hard to come overcome them. And it goes on from there. So it actually talks about actually how difficult it's been for me as a person, as a black man, as a person of color, as a, somebody who's from the Caribbean background, 
all different sorts of layers. Because even I've had to ask these sorts of questions of myself. And what I, if I haven't been able to do this in a group, in a group setting, what I have actually done um, with, with groups online, for example, is sent out the questionnaire to the group so they can fill it in themselves and get them to break into smaller groups and to work with whatever the results were in those smaller groups. So you can do it in an online space. Let's move on. One of the interesting things about issues of difference, when we talk about racism, sexism, homophobia, and so on, is that we actually reject or forget, let's say forget, the fact that these are relational experiences. I experience racism, for example, on the basis of somebody else, somebody else's experience of who I am. So there are two of us in an experience of racism. It often gets missed in discussions around what racism actually is. Uh, for example, the brilliant psychoanalyst and group, group therapist, um, Fahad Dalal, I wrote about, about racism, for example, as being a process whereby it's prejudice plus power. So where a person has a certain prejudice, and they have a certain power based on their privilege, for example, that can actually lead a person to actually have, uh, a, a, it needs to be racist over another person. What we often forget though is that actually, in order for that other person to experience racism or sexism or homophobia or ableism, whatever it might be, there has to be a process of othering. We have to make the other person less than they actually are. I've got two definitions up there. You'll get these slides later on. I'm just going to go through them very briefly now. The, sociolo the sociological perspective actually recognizes that actually when we other somebody else, we actually reject the fact that they are a complex range of different identities. And we marginalize all those other aspects and focus in on just one or two. We make them, and in doing so, we actually make that person less worthy of respect and of our shared humanity than they were before we actually met them. So we actually reduce the other person down to whatever aspect we need them to be. There is a psychodynamic or psychotherapeutic perspective though, whereby this comes from the work of Jacques Lacan, uh, who talks about othering being the process that can be applied to oneself, whereby one's experiences of, where we experience ourself as, a, as, a, um, as an other. So if you use a Jungian term about the shadow, the shadow becomes the other in relation to our own egoic sense of self. We actually marginalize parts of who we are. This comes up an awful lot, for example, whereby, let's say, um, I think Maya Angelou puts it brilliantly well in the whole idea about as black people, when we leave home in the morning, we leave everything up or parts of our blackness indoors because it's just too frightening to have out in the world, which is mainly white. So we, we self-other ourselves in order to survive in a world that's not ours. Now, how does this play out here? This simple equation talks a lot about just how prejudice and power with othering creates ageism, ableism, sexism, homophobia, and so on. It's as simple as that to understand. One of the difficult things about this whole process though, is, you know, for example, you want all to see it when people go onto, onto national TV and they start talking about just what racism is, and then somebody from the panel says, well, that's not what it is, and so on. The difficult thing about those sort of experiences is that actually what's playing itself out on the screen in front of us is this process here, is racism at play. It's the power of those on the panel to actually define what it is and to other the other person's experience. To go into a bit more detail with this as well, what is, you know, we're talking a bit, a bit, a bit more about othering. Um, I'm going to use the work of Martin Buber here, uh, a theologian um, who wrote an awful lot in the last century around uh, relationships. And his seminal book is called I and Thou. It was derived from a lot of, the, a lot of his experiences during the Second World War. Um, and he, in the book I and Thou, it's not a very long book. It's actually quite an easy read. He posits two types of relationships. The first one is an I-it relationship. And I put this through the, the lens of a client, but we can do this with any other person around us at any point at all. An I-it relationship is where we see the other person through our own eyes, where that person is there to fulfill our own particular need. And where, and therefore, because we've, we're, we're using that person, we've othered them, 
any sort of empathy for that other person is lost. We expect them to fit into our way of being over, over and above anything else. That contrasts greatly with an I thou relationship where we work with a person or, or we with, with a client from a more humble position, where we engage with the other with a spirit of curiosity and a willingness to learn about ourselves as well as the other. And that these qualities are then become essential to working cross culturally and help us to build a relationship. For example, there is, if I put this together, if you like, in psychotherapy, there's this strange idea that when we sit with a client, when I sit with a client, that the client is the other in the space with myself. I disagree with that wholeheartedly because one has to remember that any client that I work with is bringing their whole world into their space. And in a way, they're inviting me in through the front door of their own psychology. I am the other. So in the same way that I wouldn't come to any of your houses and say, I own this place, I'm going to move stuff around, I would actually enter that place with a spirit of respect and um, reverence even for the fact that I've, I've actually been allowed in this. And we've talked about this as therapists. There's, it's quite an honorable thing. I, one, I can often feel a sense of huge respect that somebody's opened up their whole world to me. That's the difference between an I it relationship where I make it about myself and an I thou relationship where I actually can recognize that actually I am the outsider in that client's world. To go a bit further, um, to talk a bit, a bit more about othering, come back to the earlier examples I just gave you just there. When we, talk, when we engage, when we recognize that othering is going on, or when I'm being othered, when my clients will get all the time, for example, what often has to happen, though, is that I have to recognize that my own identity is put to one side. Now, I can do this as a therapist. I'm a psychotherapist. I recognize that my clients will need to use me in order to hold their projections and so on. That doesn't mean I've lost my sense of self. It just means I've put that to one side for a moment. That's very different when we're out in the world and when we're being stereotyped or objectified, for example, which are forms of othering, whereby actually the, com the complexity of one's identity gets lost because somebody else is trying to use us for their own benefit. We can all do this, and sometimes we need to do it um, in order to get through our day-to-day -day life because it's just too much, too many other people around us to actually really fully engage um, fully with the other person. So othering can often lead to a sense of putting one, one's own self to one side, but we lose, we push the, the thou, our inner thou, into the unconscious. But let's talk about how detrimental that can be for those who are not expecting that experience. Now, I've got a couple of examples to show you right here. And they're from my, my um, client work or from the work I did on, on my doctorate several years back, where I interviewed, I think it was about 25 people about their own experience of being an outsider. Um, they talked about their experience. We, 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 uh, they tell me a bit all about it, for example. And what we also did, we did some body work and some visualization work around it too. Now, what that actually means is I asked them to meditate on what, it, what the felt experience was like of being made to be an outsider. And then as they're visualizing that, they actually came up with an image that represented that experience and they drew the image for me. That makes sense. It's a technique that I use as a psychotherapist. I'm an integrative psychotherapist and we often use crazy techniques to understand unconscious internalized experiences because that's what I was looking for. When we're made to be an other, how does the thou actually play itself out in that sort of unconscious space? This first one here is from one of the people I interviewed. His name was Carl, about 42 years of age. Uh, a gay man who was bullied at school for being seen as overly feminine by his peers. Similar to, yeah, similar sort of experience, if you like, to the one my daughter went through around race. And when we actually revisited that experience of being made to be an outsider, he drew, he talked about it thusly, and he drew the following, following uh, example here, and I'll talk about what he, what, what he says. He says, you know, at a time from a young age, I got into drawing female figures, and I would draw them and draw them and change things about them. But once I'd finished them, I'd put them in the bin. I didn't want them to be found out. I didn't want to show them to anyone. I think it was just a way of me expressing that feminine side of me that I was ashamed of as, as well. So I think this was a way of expressing that, but cloaking it in a lot of darkness. 
And for those of you who can't see the image, I'll talk to you about it now. It's actually an image of, the, of a woman, as he said in, in the interview, stood on the banks of the river Styx, waiting for death to come and take her away. So what's become internalized in Carl's example is that self-destructiveness around his own, uh, around that which is seen as an other, which you know, his peers had said, you're too feminine. So therefore he, 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 he translated that into, into an image on a, on, a, on a piece of paper and he literally tear these things up and destroy them time and time again. This is just a, a, one way of showing you just how difficult it is to be another when we make when we're not, not expecting it and how deeply internalized these experiences can actually become if we are not careful. To give you another example here, um, Alessandra was a woman who was raised in Venezuela, if I remember rightly, uh, within a small Jewish community there. She did her university degree, though, in Buenos Aires. And while she was living in Buenos Aires, uh, during one, I can't remember exactly when this would have been, but there was an incident at a, a Jewish center that w- w- there was a bombing. And I think several people lost their lives, sadly. And um, she was in a cab going to the airport, about to fly home, when she heard news of this uh, bombing. And whilst in the cab, the cab driver said, well, you know what? They're not really Argentinians. They're just Jewish. At which point she was absolutely furious, understandably so, but sadly said very little. And she regretted actually standing up for herself and speaking up and saying what she needed to around what this, this, this taxi driver had said to her. Now, when we work with this image, with, with, with this experience, she related it to a film called The Pianist, which I probably saw a long time ago. Um, she said, well, it's in the film. It's this family. They're in the house on the top floor and they're SS men. Um, and it was so easy. They knock on the door and they open it and they found these people there and they start treating them badly. There's a grandfather in the wheelchair and they just literally throw him out of the window into the winter. A totally defenseless person. I'm just, it just, it makes me tearful as I couldn't watch the film after that. And the image that she's drawn is literally of the boots of the old man in the wheelchair tumbling outside of the window and down into the snow beyond. That's the difficulty of the experience that she had internalized. But we're going to go a bit further with this one. You know, we've looked at how one can work with this, say, say on a more imaginal level. Um, but there are other ways that we can internalize that. And I know before we, you all came onto the, onto the conference this morning, I was actually talking to Niall about the power of dreams and dreaming. I'm a great one for dreams. I'm going to talk to you about one particular dream that I had, um, which talks about what it's, some of my experiences of, of internalized racism, if you like. Uh, but it's built on some of the ideas um, of, of Fanny Brewster, who wrote a brilliant book. It, it's, it's out there now. It, it came out last year called The Racial Complex. Um, Fanny Brewster's The Racial Complex, for those who are writing notes. Um, and I just want to talk a bit about, first of all, how we understand internalized isms and obias. So, for example, in a society where racial prejudice thrives in politics, communities, and institutions, and poor cultures, it is difficult for racial minorities to, to avoid absorbing the racist messages that constantly bombard them. This is no different from any other group. We're all influenced and impacted by the messaging that we're given that we are not okay, that, it's, that we're not accepted for who we happen to be. You know, from uh, the trans community having to endure the regular slings and arrows of marginalization on Twitter by prominent authors, for example, whose names will remain, 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 remain uns- unspoken, to uh, the constant fights of the Me Too generation, to actually recognize that actually patriarchy has caused a hell of a lot of pain for generations. As a psychotherapist, though, um, it's common knowledge that experiences are internalized. For example, uh, from the internalized mother and father to an internalized abuser, we take on our experiences all the time. I probably should have put there, we take into ourselves all of our experiences. We talk about internalized objects from the very beginnings of psychotherapy. Melanie Klein talked about these things. This is nothing new. And yet for some reason, what we've actually chosen to do is to, re- is to fail to recognize that um, it's, it's fail to recognize that these internalizations can happen when we experience uh, impacts of racism, be they microaggressions, the more overt um, hatred of our own otherness. 
of course, we're going to be left with experiences that will stay with us unless we as professionals or others can work with them, either on ourselves or on others. And I am no different to any other person on this call today in that experience. Now, one of the ways that I, like I said, I tend to work with these things is through the notion of dreams. Um, now, what I've just put, put up here is, is a you know, dream is a compensation. Just one idea about dreams that, that Carl Jung talks about. Um, but for example, any sort of dream, according to Jung, is there to compensate for an external reality. So, for example, if I go back to like uh, Maya Angelou's example of where, we, you know, as a person of color, we might have to leave our, my sense of otherness indoors when I go out into the world. Literally, you know, logically, my dream would compensate for that marginalization by, present, by presenting something in the imagery of the dream that reconnects me with my sense of otherness. So it may be another a, a black person or a black character, or, or it could be more shadowy aspects, something more primal. Um, what he also says there is that if we go too far, if we fail to reintegrate that which we put to one side, that what can often happen is uh, that part of ourselves becomes hypertrophied and starts to become more and more aggressive, starts to act upon us in a more and more aggressive way. So the more that we can be aware that we're impacted by a world outside of ourselves that doesn't accept us, the more likely it is that we can soften the impact of said dreams so therefore we can work with them and integrate them safely and become less scary. One of the couple of things I will say about dream symbols as well. For those of you who bought books where, where you get all these wonderful ideas what symbols are, they aren't always that helpful. One of the, the guiding points that I often make about any dream is that each part of a dream is you. So even if it's something negative, they're still a part of, that's still a part of yourself. And what's having a dream a long time ago where this isn't even, well, partly is about, about this sort of thing on top of Gary, whereby I was stood at the top of the stairs, about to go downstairs to a kitchen. In the, in the kitchen downstairs, Hannibal Lecter is stirring a pot of food, food, inverted commas, as it's Hannibal Lecter. Now, I have to recognize that as well as being the part of myself that's fearful to go downstairs to the kitchen, part of me is Hannibal Lecter in the kitchen killing off something. Let me give you a better example than that. This dream here came up for me at the end of an interaction. I had a, it was a very strange day that I'd had with, at work, whereby I was sat in a meeting uh, talking about difference and otherness and how important it is for, for us to engage with difference. And somebody said to me along the, something along the lines of, well, you know, my hunch is... Uh, but actually, part of what they're actually doing, just acting out, when people talk about racism, they're just acting out their internalized um, parental issues. Now, I failed to say anything about that, but I was absolutely furious at, at having to hear that from an experienced colleague that I would have worked alongside around these sorts of issues, especially given the fact that they you know you felt farewell that this is my world. This is the work that I do. And to hear a statement like that is, is a, as much an attack on myself and my work as it is an attempt by them to actually put their own idea hunch above my experience. Put it that way, if that makes sense in this example. This, though, is the dream that I had that same night based upon that experience. And I'm going to read it out for yourselves. So seeing where I'm coming out of Barons Court tube station, which is in West London. I used to live nearby there, for those of you who are based in the capital. As I walk down the hill towards the Talgarth Road, I see a white man stand atop a wall. I recognize him as a Nazi. He has tattoos on his arms and face. He also has a machine gun and starts firing at the crowd of people exiting the station. When he, uh, when he stops to reload, though, myself and a couple of other people tackle him to the ground and pummel him unconscious. I then turn around to see that there are several people around a body in the road. I rush back to see that my girlfriend, a black woman, uh, is lying severely injured. She hands me a journal with pictures of cars and lorries in them, then she dies. I wake up wailing and in tears. Now, this is, where are we now? What's today's date? About 29th of, of November. It's only a month ago. And on the back of, you know, similar experience around George Floyd and so on and having dreams about stuff like that there, this is what I'd internalized from one experience working with a colleague. It could be seen as a microaggression, but these things cut deep is what I'm trying to say. But they also remind me of actually, I am, as much as I am the woman who's died, 
the black woman who's died on the road, that part of me which has been killed off in this, in, in this instance, I'm also the Nazi with the tattoos trying to kill that part of myself. That's what I've taken into myself through that experience. So for those of you who are out there now suddenly pondering your dreams, do be aware, some of this will come up in the symbology of the unconscious. Don't worry, I'm still quite sane. For those of you who are a bit, bit, bit concerned about myself, thank you very much. Now we're coming towards the end uh, of this talk. I'm going to end a little bit earlier than I, than I hoped. It's not a bad thing at all. We've talked a lot about intersectional approaches to difference and otherness. And although I've taken perhaps a mainly racialized perspective on this, what I've tried to show you all is that actually there are many ways of, of looking at intersectional approaches to difference and otherness that don't just sit within race, they sit within gender, sexuality, ableism, all sorts of different arenas. There are loads of papers out there um, for those of you who have access to them for you to read about. What I wanted to do, though, as a final piece is to show you one last piece of film, uh, which is, as you can see there on the screen, Sir, Sir Ian McKellen reading out the, the hope speech by Harvey Milk. Um, I think this would have been, he would have, he would have done that speech in the, I think the mid-1970s, if I remember rightly. And for myself, for myself, this brilliant, brilliant speech actually is quite intersectional in its tone and presentation. I'll just let that one hang in the air for a second. Um, what I tend to do with that video, I also play that when I do lectures or on difference and diversity. I think that talk there says an awful lot more than I ever could around the power of uh, giving those who are marginalized just a voice. And we've covered quite a lot of ground this morning. And I've got just one more slide and we'll go into some, some questions and so on. But I want to just give you a couple of quotes. Um, the first one, I actually don't know where, this, where, the, where the, what the first one on the, on the left-hand side has come from. Rock Bottom has built more heroes than privilege, which I think is an incredibly important uh, quote to, to, just to, to remember, for us all to remember that actually is a humility. If we can engage with that humility uh, alongside our privilege, then actually we can be there for those of us who need us, be they clients, peers, my daughter, whatever it might be. This is more of a transpersonal quote from, uh, from Paolo Coelho. I actually can't remember which book this, came, this comes from. It says, the irregularity of mountain peaks that surrounds us is what makes them so imposing. If we try to make them all the same, they would no longer command our respect because beauty exists not in sameness, but in difference. Those two quotes for me encapsulate an awful lot about what I've been trying to say over this past hour and 25 minutes. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there and we'll move on. There's some references there, which you'll get on the slides and we'll talk about some more bits of it as I answer some questions as well. So, Niall, do you want to carry on with the questions or? Hi, Dr. Turner. That was a brilliant presentation. Thank you very much. Um, from the chat, it seems like people really were engaged with it. They seem to get a lot from it. So, I've just got a few questions here from the participants that I'd like to ask you. All right. Sure, please. Um, please go ahead. <laughs> so there's a couple regarding the privilege and the creation of the other video, which I think people find really powerful. The first one's from Greg Madison. Um, he's asked what guided the set of questions asked in that video. I have to say, I don't actually know. My sense is that they've come, because it was done by uh, psychologists, I'm assuming that they they designed the questions themselves. So I don't actually know the, the, the rationale between, between within the, the choice of the questions themselves. Having said that, I have come across varying versions of this, of this exercise. I think people were asking a bit about, is there an online version that one can do? And there are varying ones. For example, I think there's a more anglicized one for, for those in the UK. And one's reading the one about something which is more based around people who live in Singapore. So there, is, there are ways of tweaking um, these questions so they actually fit more the cultural context that are being asked within. But I actually don't have the details as to where the original set of questions came from. So my no worries. Okay, uh, the next question is from Pauline Lewis, and it's also about the, actually, I'm not sure if it's or not, but she's asked, is privilege based on access to resources and power and intergenerational wealth? I think it's a brilliant question, because actually it's based around all of those and many more factors as well. Um, the, the thing about privilege 
intergenerational wealth can be it, it can be defined in many different ways. Um, hey, what is wealth? Is wealth knowledge? Is wealth finances? And so on. Those things can be passed on. For example, um, we often view knowledge as an idea of, 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 of wealth because it gives one a certain level of power, uh, if you like. So I think it was the, um, the Ethiopians. I can't remember. If I've got this wrong. My apologies to my colleagues out there um, who actually established the first sort of learning centers, first universities. And because they recognized that power, that, that power came with knowledge and therefore a certain privilege came with that as well. So I think privilege can be defined as many things depending on the cultural context that it resides within. That helps to make any, any sense of that. Okay, awesome. Um, the next one's from uh, Rashimir. And he asks, thanks, for, or he says, thanks for sharing the dream example, which mm-hmm. he finds super interesting. Can you go a bit further in sharing your analysis? In other words, what are the... Con- Com- compensatory aspects playing out in the three main characters and most importantly how did you work to integrate them okay the second part i'll answer first the integration is still ongoing that's it's only a month ago i hear where, where, where he's gone with that the work that i tend to do with dreams be, be it with my own therapist or if i'm working with clients normally it involves a lot of free association so I may ask a, a client about the experience of the dream like i would have been asked about my experience of that dream um and then I would have been taken through it stage by stage. What do each of the symbols actually mean for myself? For example, Baron's Court Station is a symbol. Tal Darth Road, these are symbols. What do they actually mean? And actually, part of that is those are my roots. That's my root home. That's why I would have, how I would have gone home if I was coming home from school, for example, when I was a kid. Um, also, what's my link to, to you know, what does it feel like to be, to be a Nazi? What does it like, feel like to, to have that part of my life? That's an important part of trying to work with and integrate that part of myself and staying with the difficulties of actually that's a part of me too. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, even those, those other characters, I think one of the, some of the important characters actually are the ones who, who perhaps don't get as much um, emphasis in the, in the, the example I've given you right there. It's those who take down the Nazi because they're a mixture of white and black. They're not just black, uh, black people. So there's something there, which is looking to actually help save that or, or to stop that part of myself from destroying me. Something else I've internalized. Maybe that's, that's this is where like allyship comes in for those perhaps, those out there who are perhaps interested in that sort of arena. Um, and also the symbols on the on the magazine that she's given me, the tr- the, the trucks. They look like toys to be honest, like Tonka trucks, that sort of thing. So what does that mean? And it brought up all sorts of ideas around my childhood and what it was like to what for those who remember those who were around my age having a big track of all things. It's a little electronic toy that was around in the 1980s. And having one of those, it's that sort of symbolism. So it reminded me an awful lot of my, about my childhood. But I think one of the, some of the best ways of working with dreams come with free association work um, and staying with a client's process in helping them to explore some of the difficult imagery, but only as far as the client can go. That's important. Okay. Brilliant. Um, so the next question is from Tracy. And Tracy asks... Do you believe there is a role for positive discrimination? And if yes, when do you feel it is useful? I saw that question come up in the chat. <laughs> and I love it. I think it's a great question. And I have to say, I think there are two sides in the answer to, to that one. One of the, one of the problems with, that, with, with trying to answer it definitively is this. We have to recognize that we're, although I'm talking today a lot about uh, individual trauma, uh, for example, uh, yeah, from, from the sense of being made the other to some degree. We live in a system, we live in systems, varying systems. So we're always influenced by those systemic narratives as well. I think where there's a positive to the question, where positive discrimination actually becomes quite useful, is it how do we challenge the systems? For example, as a psychotherapist, yeah, it comes in the world of psychology as well. How does the worlds of psychotherapy and psychology, how do they actually reinforce levels of outsiderness experienced by minorities in those professions or in those trainings, for example. And how would positive discrimination and actually working with um, minorities actually challenge the systemic narrative, therefore making things more more acceptable uh, and more accessible for minorities, if that makes sense. <coughs> so that, for me, is where I think positive discrimination would actually become quite useful because it, then it challenges the systemic um, oppression of the other. Where it becomes less of a, uh, 
where it becomes more problematic is when it's used in a tokenistic way. I think uh, the police force, for example, are yet again engaging with another drive to, in, in, to try and um, recruit more minority police men and police pe men and women, basically. Um, and my view on that is actually that doesn't change the systemic narrative. Yes, you can flood the police force with more people, but they're still governed by the same rules that people are complaining about anyway. Makes sense? So it's depends on how that's used for myself. Yeah, Great question. Okay. Makes sense. Um, I find it really interesting what you said, and I'm going to misquote you here, but I think this will be the gist of it. Uh, basically, you said privilege is only tyrannical if you don't use it in service of the other or something to that effect. Could you maybe expand upon that? Because I, I, I thought that was really, that was really interesting. Sure, sure. Another way, it's quite it's tyrannical. I love that one. I must use it myself. I think it's one of those, it's one of those sort of, a, I think where I was going with that one is the idea that people often view privilege as something bad. You know, if some, if we have white privilege, if we have patriarchal privilege, patriarchy, by the way, is a form of privilege, but it's a bad thing to hold. It's not, because what I'm actually sort of saying is we all have access to it. I'm sitting here as a heterosexual man, so therefore I'm given a certain amount of privilege based upon those parts of my identity. How I use those then dictates whether I'm using them in service to the other, in service to black women, for example, or in service to um, other minorities in, 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 in the black community, for example, the LGBTQ community, often feels like they're an outsider within the black community. So how do I assist them in, in, in a way? That if I, if I come at it from, a, from that sort of perspective, then there's a chance for me to, uh, it, it, it takes something more humble, uh, empathic, in order for me to do so. That's a very different thing to me actually using, I'm using that word for, 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 uh, for a reason, using my privilege to dominate another. Mm. Makes sense? So your, your point about tyrannical, actually, it's not a bad word to use because often when we form an identity and if I say, okay, you know what, I am a white man, I, I, this is who I am as a man or whatever else, then anything that doesn't fit into my own idea of what I am then gets marginalized and then there's a fight to maintain that sense of marginalization. It's where power comes into play. And, and it can be quite tyrannical. It can be quite tyrannical against the external other. It can also be quite tyrannical against one's internal other as well. This is where ideas of defences come on in our work. So I don't know if I, I sort of answer your point there. So. Very interesting. So in some sense, are you, are you saying that, you know, if, if you have privilege, um, the one way that you could maybe reduce the kind of shame that goes along with, with, with having that is by using that privilege in service of others. Like if you're in a position yep. where you can actually influence something and do something about it, yep. um, then yeah, you can, you can do it that way. Is that fair to say? I mean, it's, it's very fair to say. I think it's a very fair way of saying it. You know, the number of, um, yeah, the, there was a bit, that's where I'm putting it. I think mean, that's a good way of saying it. Um, I think there's also this, the, the part about being aware of the fact that we actually feel a level of shame about our, our privilege and connecting with that. And that's often the work of, say, doing something like the privilege walk or, or work in therapy and so on. Okay, cool. Um, the next question is from Sharmila. Um, she asked, the developmental stages slide you showed suggests that prejudice starts early. I've always felt that, I've always felt combating ism needs to start early. Do you have any ideas about how we can do this effectively? So how to combat isms from an early age? Well, this is the thing. Um, one of the things I didn't say in the, in the slides, it's probably it's important to raise, raise it right now, is some of the isms, some of the, the, the prejudices that we, that, that we form at an early age are actually about identity formation. So as much as we can combat them or challenge them in an ex, you know, as parents, as teachers, um, as caregivers for those children, for example, there's also, there also has to be the understanding, um, also the understanding that actually these are, are children who are trying to form a sense of who they are and how do they do that. And does that need to be, I think the question then becomes, does that need to be uh, in conflict with another or in relation to another? That makes sense. How harsh does that need to be? And I think that, so I think there is room to actually look at some of these things in schooling environments and so on, you know, um, my daughter, who's actually five years old now, started school just last September. And 
they had a whole, uh, of course, they celebrated Black History Month, and she came home and talked to me about um, about my uh, was it about sitting at the back of the bus and so on, and what that might, might, might have been like, and, and those sorts of stories. And that was for me was really quite empowering to hear that actually she has she's she's developing a sense of what it is to be a young black woman based upon her schools. I mean, how we engage with that in, in the school arena is important. I know there are all sorts of debates, perhaps more so in the Midlands, around whether there should be sort of LGBTQ lessons in schools. I believe there should be. Um, and I think it's, it's quite important that actually schools do engage with this material quite early on. Often parents won't do so. And often parents will resist. But I think it's quite important to, for, for children to actually recognise that they can be themselves but not marginalize somebody else in order to be themselves. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. So the next one is from Monica and she's asked, will current social distancing rules have any effect on future social and cultural relations in your opinion? Oh, that's a brilliant question. So pardon me sitting here thinking to myself, I don't know, because I think we're still in the pandemic. That's the, that's the difficult thing, thing about the, that, that sort of question. We're still in the grips of it. And I've done a number of talks around the impact of um, of COVID-19 and lockdowns on minority groups across the board. I'm hearing all sorts of stories um, about, there was a, some of you see websites, uh, because of lockdowns, the, the re, there seems to have been, I hate this, a return to the genderized roles of the home, which has set equalities uh, for women, perhaps back a generation. I think when we come out of all of this, we'll need to look at just how we've been impacted by by what's gone on for ourselves um, over the over the past year. It's going to be a year by the time we all get out of this. So I actually don't know the answer to this one. I think it's going to be very interesting how this one plays itself out. I don't think we're going back to how things were beforehand, because uh, I don't think we can do. One of the positive things about all this is actually that we are talking about the layers of oppression that really do sit ingrained within our society um, in a way that we possibly haven't, perhaps we haven't for, for a while, because we we have to, I think, really, because we're, we're left, we can't gloss over these anymore. Hundred uh, percent. So the next one is another one from Tracy. She's asked, "Do you think that unconscious bias training is useful and effective?" And if yes, where are its limitations? <laughs> I, I think what I love about the question there, the answer, straight answer is no. I think it's, uh, I can't stand unconscious bias training. A funny story, I had to do unconscious bias training for the university that I work at, and I failed first time around. Um, and it became a bit, bit like, okay, I just have to answer the questions and get through the training. I think unconscious, I get where it's come from, but I, it's a bit like um, skimming the first, the, the top surface of an understanding of something and saying, well, we've done our job. And I think lots of the, lots of what I'm talk, what trying to talk, talk about here is this goes way deeper than just that, that layering. Um, and I think it's important. I think unconscious bias training could go a lot further if people were just willing to do so. And I think it's gotten trapped in its own. You think, you think we have to understand something. When we do this sort of work about difference and diversity, what we're also doing is challenging our own identity. And I think what something like unconscious bias training does is knocks on the door, but doesn't risk that change of who we actually have to change within ourselves, a change that has to happen in order to engage better with the other. Okay. Interesting. Um, we've got one here from Charlene. What does that mean, or what does it mean that psychology and psychotherapy theories and models that are Eurocentric and male therapists are then applying to applying those therapy theories to black and other peoples of color's experience, mm -hmm. and these might not fit and could reinforce othering? How do you manage this? This is where again we're back to systemics. In a way, and psychotherapy courses and trainings have been guilty of this for, 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 or since their inception. And this is the odd thing about it: the works, the early works of some of the great founders like Freud and so on, they weren't rooted in the system. They, they, they've come from outside, if you like, developed their own ideas, 
made them a cup of coffee, but they're not, they're flawed in their own way and then brought them into the middle. And I think what happens with these, um, with the need for, for training courses and so on, or the drive for training courses to actually maintain a Eurocentric patriarchal narrative around psychotherapy is that actually maintain the marginalization of the other. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, you know, the number of times through it could be all sorts of minorities. I remember once asking a group of students who were doing their masters, though they already had four years of training, to name five female, five women psychotherapists. And they struggle to do so. But they can name five men just like that because they've become, I hate this word, inculcated into the Western white male narrative around psychotherapy. So what I often do with anything like this is I will try and make it as diverse as I possibly can in its teaching. Now, often that means I've got to lean outside of psychotherapy to do that. But that's not a bad thing. One of the reasons I played Sam Cooke earlier on is because actually within the black community, how we express knowledge and information is through the arts. Comes up a lot in the working classes in this country. Now, a few comments about the working, about, about class as well, which I hope we come on to it in, in, in a minute. We, we, there isn't just one way of expressing knowledge. The idea that it's got to be rooted within academia is actually hugely flawed. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. So well, anything that I write about or research could come in, you know, I'll bring in public enemy tracks, for example, or I'll talk about, like I said, Myra Angelou or whoever it, whoever it might be. Um, I'll use examples from popular culture because they hold relevance. And I don't care if, if stuffy traditional psychotherapists with long beards don't like what I have to say. <laughs> hey, a new flavor in your ear, new times. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, I ran for the next, so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> next question is from Kemi. Uh, how do you respond, if at all, with individuals who struggle to accept or understand the idea of white privilege? Uh, um, with individuals who struggle... Mm. That's a good question. Can I, I can't make somebody understand, uh, understand that they have a certain type of privilege. Um, but what I can do is lay it out for them. Um, Actually, because white privilege is such a big topic. I think what happens is with ideas of white privilege that lots of white people get very defensive about the idea about white privilege as if it's actually just all about whiteness. It technically isn't. Again, when we talk about systems like this, like white privilege, like patriarchy, they evolved from their original programming, if you like, a long time ago. So white privilege... It's not just about whiteness. There are plenty of non-white people who will buy into the idea of white privilege. There are plenty of women who will buy into the idea of patriarchal privilege. And there are plenty of, of, of LGBTQ uh, persons who will buy into the idea of heteronormativity as a form of privilege as well. We do it as a way of adapting to fit in and to feel safe. Um, and it's a far more nuanced and, and, and you know, it's, it's a big old topic. But for those who won't engage with it, I'm not going to make them. But what I am going to do is say, well, actually, for myself, it exists. I don't need somebody else to agree with me for me to, be, for, 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 for me to feel safe. I know it exists. I know that probably I've felt, I've felt safe within it in times gone by. But I don't feel safe within it now, for example. <coughs> so it's important to recognize how I feel, not how the other person feels. Mm, okay. Um, what, if any, cultural assumptions around diversity would frustrate you the most? Like, what, what things that most people take for granted around this subject? Are, is there anything that kind of frustrates you? Ah, oh, that's a whole other two-hour conversation. Um, in a way, I think. Oh, it's a good question. What frustrates me around these sorts of conversations that, that people don't don't get or, or whatever it is? It's I think what it is that, that, that one of the things that really t- starts to 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 yeah you know, get on my nerves about this is when people are um, silently complicit. Let's put it that way in the acquaintance of other groups. So I don't mind if. Um, 
let's say someone from, let's use a political term, somebody from the far right comes in and they spout their, their, their narrative around race and difference, whatever else, and, you know, with women's roles and all that sort of stuff. I actually don't mind. I'd rather, because I can see that coming. And I can work with that. What frustrates me most of all is people on the left, for example, and the reticence to acknowledge that they have a huge role to play still in the oppression of others. This is something that Stuart Hall, a uh, brilliant man, talked about in some of his writings, that actually the left could be just as complicit, in fact, perhaps even more so than the right, um, in playing out <sighs> exclusionary tropes, racism, sexism, whatever it might be. And they tend to do so in a, in a, in a, in a very subtle way that actually galvanizes the right and then makes the other the enemy. The best example I can come up with is this. There was a whole debate earlier on this year about whether um, God Save the Queen, wasn't it? It should be sung at the proms, something like that. So a group of executives at the BBC had made a decision that actually maybe we don't, we don't sing, we don't want to sing the words, whatever else. And there was a whole debate on Good Morning Britain and other TV shows asking black people about this, this, this whole decision. Now, Black people aren't marching the streets saying, don't sing God Save the Queen. <clears throat> this was a decision made without our say-so. And I think those sorts of things annoy me. If you want to know what we think, ask us. Yeah. But what, it, what happens there is it becomes a weapon used to beat the other up with, if you like, and whilst also reinforcing the right to sing God Save the Queen. So it reinforces the racism built into the into the into the story in the first place. And that for me is something that annoys me. That actually there's a game being played and we're caught in the middle, ultimately. 100 percent Okay. Uh we've got one from another one from Greg here. Greg asks, do you see any issues in working from a school of therapy that uses theories of the unconscious in terms of oppression of the client? replacing their own language with the theories or reinforcing the privileged view of the therapist? Oh, again, another great question. Some very intelligent people. Uh, yes, I do. Hence why in any sort of work around unconscious material, the, any sort of knowledge has got to come from the client. Um, don't get me wrong. Power dynamics are going to be there in the therapy anyway. When it comes to my, my point I made earlier on around who's the other in a therapy space. I think if I'm going to use work around, if I'm going to work with, with um, let's say, dreams, the client's dreams, and they're of a minority group, um, I'm going to ask them what they mean and even encourage them to actually look at, okay, what's the cultural meaning behind that that symbol? That we'll even investigate it together. And it's got to come from them. I may have a hunch about something, but that's my hunch. And that's for me to take away to my own supervisor and say, okay, this is what I'm thinking. Because it could be wrong. So I'm not there to lead a client in any direction they don't want to, to follow. Their direction will come become apparent over a period of time during the because of the work we do together. Okay. Um, next question is from Eileen. Uh, Eileen says, challenging identity is an area I work in by training in cultural awareness and self-awareness. Giving it is more popular to undergo anti-racism training or unconscious bias as you did for your university. How do you encourage people to explore the self to understanding inclusion and diversity? Did you deliver in the end what you felt was more more important? I'm not sure what that means. Um, about identity. The talk I've given here is forms the basis of, of, of a lot of what I talk about when I deliver it to students. And I think where I'm quite lucky, you know, I, let's contrast the two. That, um, Unconscious bias training is about a way of the university covering itself, and that's fine. That's up to them. I'm here to develop psychotherapists. So part of that exploration is who are you, ultimately? So the work that uh, the presentation would have done here, together with other work we would, have done on that, we would have done on our weekends, would involve an exploration of who are they? Where are their privileges? How that, does that form their identity? Where are they the other as well? Because any psychotherapist on a, decent, on a, on a good enough training, it's quite a good enough training, is looking to change who they happen to be. It's not just about becoming a therapist or becoming a psychologist even. It's about who am I? Um, you know, I started on this sort of journey to, be, to into psychotherapy when I was about 29 years of age. 
but I didn't start with an idea about becoming a therapist. I started with an idea about doing some self-development work on myself. So I, want, I was in trouble, needed to know who I was and how I could actually have a better life for myself. Becoming a therapist became secondary. And often for me, I think that's the, often for, I often think that's the right way around. You've got to be willing to actually do the exploration on yourself and look at your own identity and how that changes. That's a great answer. Um, for the psychotherapist at home or any kind of helping professional listening to this that wants to educate themselves in the best possible way so that and they, they're they conscious of them and th they can work in a way with their clients, wor work with a wide range of clients from diverse backgrounds, what, what resources would you recommend? Like, How would you recommend people approach their education in this area? Well, I think this is some slides on, on, on the screen there, which I think are, are start points. Um, but you know what? I often refer people back to, because if, if anyone who's entering this sort of profession and is interested in self-development work, they'll have an element to them which will be, I don't know, uh, a revolutionary. Maybe they're feminists or maybe they're, they're into sort of intersectional theories, maybe they're into race relations, maybe they're into LGBTQ issues, whatever it might be. I actually always say, go back to that. Start there. Because that's a part of who you are, if you like. That's a part of the, that's a part of you that actually wants to see beyond the Eurocentric narratives um, and work with those. You know, I've been reading uh, Malcolm X's work, for example, and Martin Luther King since I was probably in my, my late teens, early 20s. Those haven't gone away. Um, whatever... Um, if, you're, if there's something that drives you, that moves you, then read about it. And the same way, actually, I always encourage people to write. I didn't really have to write for, for, uh, for articles, whatever else. I love blogging, for example. I'll write blogs all the, well, all the time, so I need to get paid as well. Um, but I, if there's something that annoys me, then I'll write about it, so I'll get engaged. Use that fire to, to focus yourself on how you can develop yourself um, around difference and diversity, because I'm guessing that whoever's coming today for this, this conference day, you're interested in issues of diversity, issues of difference. Um, do I encourage people to get political as well? Maybe not, but to get ethical, yes. Because we all have that drive to want the best for the people around us, be it just immediate family or otherwise. Use that. 100%. Um, so your first book now has been published in February 2021. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about the book? And is there anywhere people can pre-order it online or where can they find out more information about it? Sure, sure. Well, it's up on the uh, Amazon website. Um, it's released on the 3rd of February 2021 uh, called Intersections of Privilege and Otherness um, within uh, Counseling and Psychotherapy, published through Routledge. It's also on the Routledge website as well um, for those who want to want to access it there. Basically, the book talk, takes um, a more in-depth look at where intersectional theory actually work, uh, sits within psychotherapy, within our clients, within our, our participants, within ourselves to some degree. It, it goes into a lot more detail around some of the material we've talked about today, um, but also looks at how, for example, you know, there are issues around how shame we touched on it today. How does shame um, play out, play itself out in experiences of the other? Where does shame fit? Is it, it, for me, it feels like it's been battered around a bit. So is there shame in, in holding privilege? Um, sometimes there is. But where does that shame end up? Probably in the pockets of the other is, what, is one idea. Issues around death. How does death play itself out? And where does, how do we reconnect with the ideas of the death driver as originally posited by, by Sigmund Freud? Um, and also, you know, how can we use our experience of privilege as an otherness as a way of developing an idea, a better idea of who we are? Those sorts of ideas come into. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, well, Dr. Turner, I think we'll, we'll end it there. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to have you this morning. It's been a great start to the day. I think everybody's really enjoyed it. So thank you so much for sharing some of your knowledge with us. Um, everybody else, we're back at one o'clock for our next talk on the science of diversity from Mona Sue Weismark and her team. So um, have you got any uh, parting thoughts you want to leave us with, Dr. Turner, or anything you want to just s say or... No, well, only, only other than you know, apologies for the technological bits earlier on. It's been it's an absolute pleasure to present this for yourselves this morning. I'm just looking at all the chats, saying great session. Thank you very much for taking the time to actually tune in on a Sunday morning. Always an absolute pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your day.
100%. Thank you, Doug Turner. I'll see everybody at one o'clock. All right. Cheers, guys.